So yeah, I was just saying, if you have any kind of questions or um, you know uh, ways that you're that's more related to your practice into the VR AR side of things, let me know because I don't necessarily want this to be a generic conversation or a presentation specifically. Sam, to be honest, I I have so many questions about this because the project I wish to do now relies heavily on AR and I've never done any AR before and right. it's really intimidating. Well, what's your project? Okay, so the project includes, I'm a jewelry designer and yep. I make uh, stuff, I make stuff and I want to, uh, to be able to um, 3D scan and then make into a 3D model every, every one of them yep. and then bring them into an AR experience. And so when, you say, I... when you say AR, do you mean with a headset or do you mean with a tablet or do you mean something else? I think I would prefer it to be on, a, on some kind of a mobile device because most people have that, I suppose. And if it's possible for it to be something that you can point towards your hair, hand and see the, the ring or something like this, mm -hmm. I would think that this, the reason why I want to do this is because I want to bring the... Um, the jewelry from different places because this is a natively physical object and art. Yeah. They want to give it the virtual experience, which is at least as closest as possible. I cannot make the same feeling. The tactile feeling is not yeah. transmittable through vir to the virtual experience, but at least the visual element is great. And I think it's going to bring the contemporary jewelry art world together more because now everything depends on physically being on a on a fair on a festival on somebody exhibition and i just really want to do it it's going to bring us closer yeah so um that's very interesting i'll 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 talk about fashion and uh ar um because that's a big thing actually next year i'm going to be going full blast into that direction as well And yeah, it is fascinating. <laughs> Anybody else that's got some specific questions about VR or AR, whether it's your project or whether it's your struggle. Um, I know last time we talked about a lot of like, hey, you don't have a lot of money, but you're thinking about doing VR or AR. So how do you get it? Um, but if there's anything that you're thinking of for your own projects, I can hone in on that topic if it's. So can I ask a question? So uh, when you say a VR word, uh, which software do you you use? Like I, I was searching, uh, should we turn uh, a real engine? It's okay. Should we turn the software? Or you have a specific software to make a VR word. Yeah. So when you're talking about VR and AR, you're normally going to be talking about two major tools to do that, which are called game engines. So you're going to be using usually Unity or Unreal, um, and they both have their advantages. And uh, you know, you can. Some people learn both. It's hard. I would say. Um, It's changing a lot. Like Unreal has got some pretty crazy technologies coming out this year. Uh, I would say probably Unity. I use Unity. I would say probably Unity is easier to learn. I would also say that Unity is usually the first to support new VR and AR headsets, whereas Unreal is a little bit later. So, for example, um, you know, the Magic Leap Meta 2, uh, I'm sorry, Magic Leap uh, 2 is going to be coming out early next year. And so I expect that it'll be available to work with in Unity much faster than it'll be available to work with in Unreal. Maybe wrong, maybe things have changed, but usually that's how it goes. It's easier to get support on Unity for VR and AR. So, um, so yeah, you kind of go into the world of game engine design, of game engine with, um, with Unity if you want to do a VR experience. And with that being said, you know, Unity, is a, Unity and Unreal are a place where you put a bunch of assets, whether they're animations, whether they're sculptures, whether they're photogrammetry like 3D capture or 
whatever, 2D, 3D, and you lay it all there. And from, from there, you can create a VR experience, create a mobile experience, create a PC game, create a mobile game. So you can, you can even do PS4 or PS5, Xbox. You can create a game for any platform, uh, basically, especially on Unity. So those are kind of like your nexus where everything goes to Unity or Unreal, and then it pushes to everything possible. So if you're in VR or AR, I, I definitely recommend slowly learning Unreal, slowly learning, uh, I mean, Unity or Unreal. And really, it's, it's like, you know, you make a project, you bring a bunch of stuff, you place that stuff around, then you can do pretty much an unlimited amount of stuff, right? If you have a programmer or if you program, you can animate stuff. You can have AI. You can do things. I mean, I'm in architecture, so I keep it simple. I make an environment, and then I put art in that environment. Then I put my little you know, Oculus camera, uh, which is uh, prefabricated. I go download it for free on the store. So it's a free asset. And then when you place a little VR camera in there, and you've got your environment, you know, there's a few things like uh, add collisions. You need to add collisions so people don't fall through floors or whatever. But once you watch a tutorial on it, it's like you put your environment, you put the art in the environment, you put your little VR camera, you press play or you export, and now you have a VR game. So it's generally pretty simple. I remember, you know, I bought a VR headset in 2016 or something. And within a week, I was in, you know, I'm, I study architecture. So I was in my building in VR. Uh, within a week, just learning by myself. So it's not too, too complicated. Like, it's not like a year of school to do it. Uh, if you want the doors to open and fireworks to go and people to be walking around and stuff, yes, it gets more complicated. But I keep it simple. Static environment, static art. You're in the art in VR. That's kind of the, the step where I want to go, basically. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. For sure, got you, man. Thank you. Uh, I, I I am learning a little bit of Unreal, uh, like six months, that and it's very good to hear that. I was a little bit confusing that uh, the game engine is uh, Nexus software to to use, but you you uh, they could work to me to learn more. Thank you. Nice. Um, anybody else has got like particular questions about VR or AR that's specific to their projects? So far, I'll be focusing on fashion and AR, unless uh, there's anybody else has got some more uh, particular topics. OK. I'll give you a chance to uh, talk anytime. Feel free to share your cameras as well. It's always nice to see people, uh, you know, during the end of the world when we're all alone in our uh, homes. <laughs> and so, if you want to show your camera, it's always nice to see the body language. Um, all right, so it's uh, seven minutes past twelve. So I'll get started. Um, let me see here. Do I want to do the PowerPoint? I kind of don't want to because I threw this together real quick. No, let's just jump into fashion and AR. So, um, you know, I curate VR art shows, VR and AR art shows at a gallery, well, at two galleries to be specific in Montreal. And one of my favorite projects was, was with uh, Ines Alpha from France, who, if you're not familiar with her, she does augmented reality makeup or masks, if you will. And it's it's also kind of one of my favorite topic is just um, fashion and augmented reality. So you know, um, let's think about how fashion is is uh, is going on. I guess there's a lot of aspects of it, right? So one of the OG ways of fashion being experienced uh, in the metaverse. So you guys are all familiar with the metaverse, right? It's like this. At the basic level, it's um, multiplayer games. And at a more advanced level, it's multiplayer VR, multiplayer AR. And at a, a philosophical or you know sci-fi level, it's all of these multiplayer worlds interacting to each other, uh, between each other seamlessly. So the old school metaverse, we could say, is something like Second Life. 
But if you look at Second Life, there's already a market for buying clothing, buying jewelry, buying avatars, and uh, you can literally sell dresses and people will, will buy them. It's kind of like the pre-NFT world a little bit. So we know that there's kind of a thirst for um, digital fashion, uh, digital expression, digital beauty in, in this world. And it's probably just going to grow as our avatar presence uh, becomes more important in the world of VR and probably especially augmented reality when it comes to the point where we have glasses, especially. So, um, you know, one of the things I'm planning for 2022 is a, uh, a class basically with this organization called Ling de Fuite in Montreal, which um, mentors young fashion designers, uh, really cool fashion designers. And so I'll be showing them 3D scanning, VR, AR. We'll be talking about all of NFTs. We'll be talking about a lot of the stuff that um, I guess I'll, I'll be chatting. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have a question? OK. Um, so yeah, right now, there, there's kind of different things, right? If you were to do fashion or VR uh, or 3D fashion, you could say, like, for example, I'm interested in uh, fashion runways in VR. So let me just maybe share a video here I, of a project I did in 2018. Um, it'll explain a little bit more. Uh, sorry, should have probably been a bit more organized. But uh, uh, screen share. OK, here we go. All right, so this is um, this is a show that we did where we scanned a bunch of people in 3D with both a Kinect camera, which allowed us to have these animations, as well as a really good photo rig, um, which has something like 140 cameras all shooting at the same time. So we had this very basic 3D scanning, and then we had this very high-end 3D scanning. The basic 3D scanning let us do animation, but it was kind of low quality, whereas high-end 3D scanning, which you're seeing here, let us do one static shot at a time. Um, and then we went and mixed them into a kind of uh, giant experience. So this was the morning after kind of recording. Uh, and let me show you my favorite oh, sequence here. It's called what's going on here. Oh, nice. Do, 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 do. All right, so here we have the creator whose face is taking on the entire wall, and then somebody else comes out of her face and just starts parading around. So, um, you know, this is one way that you can look at uh, VR fashion, where you're taking the real world, you're kind of mixing it in Unity or in Unreal, and then you're showing it again, whether it's in VR, in AR, or just as a video, right? You could sell this as a video, as an NFT, of course. Now, earlier there was a question of... Um, it's like Lego is for adults. I'm sorry? Uh, so I think <laughs> is, is That's pretty funny. There's oh, they have Seinfeld, too. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's really weird. Hey, Garrison, I think you're unmuted. Yeah, <laughs> not sure if you're talking to me or if it's unrelated. Um, all right, so now, OK, yeah, we can do. Hello? Good. Hey, Sam, just a quick question on that. Um, could you probably let us know later how it, uh, a little bit of details about how you um, do, how, what, you, what technology you use for connecting the Kinect and how do, how do you actually do the the video, how, how is this actually yep. done? And also what kind of 3D scanning, high-end 3D scanning, what kind of technology was used in that case? Sure, so let's dive into that real quick. Um, so the technology for the Connect was uh, called Brekel, B-R-E-K-E-L. And it's this one guy in Europe somewhere who's a giant nerd. And all he cares about is um, letting you scan stuff and exported in multiple different um, 
formats. So he's just completely obsessed with this topic. And so if you look up uh, Brickell, B-R-E-K-E-L, you'll see that he has these tools that will allow you to take kind of, whether it's a 3D camera from Intel, from uh, Microsoft, or from other companies, he supports a lot of 3D cameras and lets you export with those. Um, so right now there is, uh, you know, back then I was using the Kinect 2, which is from Xbox. So it's pretty low quality. It was $200 and you needed a special cable, which is really hard to find. Or you needed the Kinect Microsoft version, which is also hard to find because the, the one, one that, that I have is the, the Microsoft version. Yeah. So you'll just for clarification, the regular one that came with your Xbox didn't have a USB uh, cord, whereas the Microsoft version has a USB cord, meaning it can go into your computer. And then if you have the Xbox, you need the fancy cable. And so probably 90% of them are on Xbox and they're not the Microsoft version and the fancy cable is probably really hard to find now. If you go on eBay, you may be able to find it, um, but you know, it may take a couple months to do it. The newer version is called Connect Azure and it's kind of sold out everywhere for a year or two now with the pandemic especially. So I have two of those um, and they're more expensive. They're more like 600 bucks um, instead of 200. And um, they're made to, they've got higher quality, et cetera. So my next generation of the project will be using that. Now, the software that they used, um, the studio I showed you the images of, uh, the name of the studio owner is Eric Paré. And he has his own company called X-Angle, which makes software to handle all of that. So it's not every day that you're going to have somebody saying, hey, I need to take uh, 150 photos all at the exact same millisecond and then send it you know, in a, specifi a specified format to a specified location with the right naming. Um, so it's very, very specialized. Now, the world generally of, uh, of art, of, of um, you know, whatever you want to call it, entertainment, is going from a transformation from uh, regular cameras to what we could call volumetric capture, which is what I showed you. And so Microsoft is, is doing this a lot. Um, they've got like, I think what's it called? Microsoft Mesh, which is basically saying, hey, we're, we're creating systems where you can capture the body as a 3D interface. And we're going to let you stream that, whether it's to VR or AR or, uh, all space VR, for example. So really, I'm kind of trying to accelerate that transformation to volumetric uh, capture. And it's not really the, the capture is hard because you need multiple cameras to do 3D scanning or you need specific cameras that, you know, much like we have two eyes. Um, like you could see me in 3D right now, but you can't see the back of my head necessarily. So you'd want to have like a bunch of cameras all over the place to do volumetric uh, capture. So I would encourage you, you know, if you can, whether it's just with Connect, right? Like it doesn't have to be a uh, crazy studio. It's like, I'm trying to get people to start playing with the volumetric capture. Cause I really think in 20, 30 years, we're going to be like, it's going to replace TVs and movies. Everything is going to become 3D or at least the best of the best is going to become 3D. And so you can do that with the Kinect. You can do that for two to $600 and kind of like have a taste of the future and start thinking, what does it mean if I make a movie in VR? What does it mean if I do a music clip, a theater play, uh, a song, a dance, a fashion show using volumetric capture? So any question on that? I know it's a bit complicated and I'm kind of like brushing over it. It sounds exciting and it sounds very, um, it sounds a bit complicated, but I guess it's just like one of those things that we just need to learn better and more about. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit like the transition from 2D to 3D in, in uh, in VR experiences, it's like, it's really exciting to do it and the rules are not written. And that's probably the most exciting part is discovering those rules, trying things out. It's like, you know, if I tell you, go make a movie, you're like, okay, I need an intro. And then I, I've seen hundreds of movies, right? I have an idea of what it's going to be. But if you say, go make me a volumetric movie, it's like, what? <laughs> How am I going to do that? What does that mean? 
And so it's a really great opportunity to fail, um, fail with style and just kind of like say, I don't know, this is what I think. Does this make sense? Um, and let me see here. There was a really beautiful experience that kind of like I, I feel like would be great for opening people's mind about it. Well, first off, there's a VR experience, The Book of Distance. So if you haven't tried that, I highly recommend it. I think you need to have a VR desktop. And it's a beautiful mix between um, movies, books, and theater. It's a beautiful mix between these mediums, and uh, it's quite inspiring for that. The other one is more of um, almost like a Dadaist collage as a movie in VR. And so that's why it was very inspiring. It's because it's, it's taking these kind of 2D languages uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's like the story about these two punk girls. But uh, maybe I can't find it right now, just on the spot. VR experience. Battle Scar. So it's called Battle Scar. Punk was invented by girls. I'm not sure about the accuracy of that statement, but uh, Battle Scar was very inspiring. And it's like, that's the thing, right? Like when we think about a movie, we don't really think about it in surreal manner. But when we think about a volumetric movie, like you saw earlier, right? Like the face was the size of the room where that's something you can do. You can have 3D text popping around uh, literally on screen like a cartoon. You can start using like a collage style in your volumetric movies. Um, so yeah, it is, it is very exciting. And the thing is with a lot of this technology too is if you wait, it's going to be a lot harder to differentiate yourself. There's like a window of opportunity that, that is historical um and goes away very shortly so it's kind of like you know google we know about google because they started right when the internet started and if they weren't there at the right time like if google tried to start google like today it would be way too late but it's been what like 11 years or something like it's not that old of a company um so the arrival of vr and the arrival of ar is a historic opening and so you can be part of that art history if you jump into it. If you see the opportunity and you say, well, it seems a bit hard. Nobody's really, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to do what everybody else is doing. It's like, there's no example. There's no template to follow. But that's part of the excitement. It's like, you're almost guaranteed to fail in a way. But, um, you know, it's, a, yeah, it's not really a failure. It's like a positive failure. It's like when you look at the first movies, it kind of seemed clunky. And when you look at the history of photography, the first photos were kind of like not as good as what we see today, but it's part of history. Um, without those early mediocre results, you wouldn't be able to evolve. And um, like, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what the language of VR movies are. We don't know what the language of AR movies are. And so it's really, really fun and exciting and full of opportunities to go in that direction. OK, unless there's any questions, I'll jump into a little bit more of the aspect of VR fashion. Um, so we saw you know, you can do a VR fashion show. You can scan people in 3D. Uh, you can scan a piece of clothing. You can scan some jewelry. Now, what about wearing them, right? In the future, we'll probably be able to wear fashion or jewelry in the online metaverse, like let's say you know, in uh, Second Life or whatever those those evolutions will be. We'll be able to wear it in virtual reality social spaces like Altspace VR or VR chat. And we'll be able to wear them in 10 to 20 years or as soon as possible, hopefully, in real life, um, in augmented reality. So much like we know about the Instagram filters that are mostly for your face, we'll, well, what's coming is we'll be able to do that for the body very soon. And so we have a bunch of platforms that are going in that direction. Now, do I think that, you know, this is the best way to experience VR fashion? Not really. Um, I do think we're going to have to wait till it becomes a regular part of our uh, wearing um, habits. And pretty much like Apple's coming out with an AR headset next year. 
Uh, Google and Microsoft are also kind of in agreement that the cell phone is dead. People just don't know it yet, and it's going to be replaced by these very uh, streamlined AR glasses that also allow us to do phone calls, but maybe you see the other person as well uh, as having all of these different services available to you. So when that moment comes, the idea of VR fashion is going to become a lot more interesting. In the meantime, it'll be a bit more of a novelty where you say, hey, look at my ring, look at with your cell phone, or you go to a fashion show and um, there's maybe AR headsets there, or maybe they provide you with tablets. So it's an avant-garde thing. It's not a thing where you're going to go and there's thousands and thousands of people that are going to buy your AR ring. But with that being said, um, that's exciting too, right? Because when the time changes, people are going to go, oh, who's making cool augmented reality jewelry? Okay, well, there's only 15 people. So let's look there, that they're part of that history of augmented reality. And they've been, most importantly, they've been thinking about it. Because that's the other thing, right? If you, if you do VR or AR while it's uncomfortable, you're thinking about it. You're, you're consuming it. You're learning from it. And when AR and VR inevitably become more mainstream and more powerful and more you know, like spread out, well, you've been thinking about it for 10, 15 years now. So you've been thinking about uh, augmented reality jewelry and what those forms are or how it should react. And I think there's also kind of like a whole other, like, remember before the internet, right? Oh, well, this is my grandpa side coming out. But before the internet, nobody was like, you know what? I need Facebook. Like, we didn't know that Facebook was a thing and that we we needed it right like right now it's like oh my god facebook is so creepy but i'm not going to delete it because it's showing me all the pictures of my families and all the events i want to go to um now if we ignore the fact that facebook is creepy as heck uh i think that vr and probably especially ar are going to have these use cases that we just couldn't imagine as a society um even needing or or their importance and when AR comes in, you know, I don't, I think there's going to be a type of, uh, well, people are going <laughs> to, there, there's going to be this, this thing, I think, like your aura, like, you know, how we express ourselves through clothing or through makeup and through jewelry. Now it's going to become incredibly easier. And there's all of this other space around us, right? And so we can start garnishing that space with something. I don't know what the digital aura is going to look like, but we can start putting in something. Or like, let me give you, uh, I'll go on a ramble for five minutes. So, uh, and ignore the, the creepy uh, aspect of this because like it's all data mining people around you. I just want to think about like the utopian artistic concept for now. But like, let's say you arrive and talk in front of somebody and the the, they're not signed up, right? So it's like, okay, I don't know anything about this person. Um, let me start looking at what they're what they're wearing. Okay, so I'm wearing like some pink and blue um, clothing. So it's like, okay, well, I don't know much about this person. It's like some dude in his 30s. So I'm gonna put some pink and blue stuff around him. Now maybe the person starts screaming angrily, right? Ah! And so now it's like, okay, well, now I'm going to start putting like more red and like violentish types of shapes around that person. Um, and then, then start saying, okay, well, what are they saying? Are they talking about uh, architecture? Are they talking about the weather? So you can start kind of making a, an image of that person, like an aura of that person based on what you know, what they look like what content they're talking, the tone, the emotions they're going through, um, their general personality. And you can imagine that going on for like their whole lifetime. And it's almost like having like a, a photo book float around you, right? Like, um, what do you care about? What are your emotions? What would that look like if you, if you literally had a digital aura around you? Whether it's something that you curate yourself or whether it's something that AI kind of adds around you based on your behavior and what you like. Um, but I think this this idea of a digital aura in fashion, like a post-physical fashion, a post-physical makeup, a post-physical jewelry is going to happen and is very interesting as a, as a topic. Like 
you could have jewelry that just kind of like morphs and changes based on your attitude, your energy level, the time of the day, as well as uh, thinking of the macro, right? What's the overall sentiment of the world? Like if there was a World War III announced tomorrow, like the entire world would be kind of depressed or angry or, or devastated, as well as what's the, what's the weather? What's the sentiment in my city right now? What's the sentiment in my country right now? What's the local sentiment? How do I feel? All of those macro, micro sentiment and states could be affected. Uh, you know, your jewelry could swing with the wind, basically. And so that was my little, uh, my little uh, five minute uh, going crazy. Um, any question or uh, comments so far? I have a comment on that. It's mind blowing first. And also it feels like if you believe that technology is, um, if you believe that technology is an extension to our consciousness in a way, People are afraid that technology is outside of us, but the way I see it, it's actually a, a, a way of us to extend ourselves to what we want to experience. And in a way, I feel like what you have just been describing is another way for the human consciousness to extend itself to something it wants to visually see before it can get to these higher levels of consciousness that you can actually feel and see them. But this is like a a next step in the evolution of consciousness in a way that you can also see the, com the, the common stuff in, in us as a um, humankind. As you mentioned, if you're, um, so if you have a necklace, which is like the shapes of the wind and the color of the rain of the, of the sky today, but tomorrow you see it kind of not so wavy, it might mean that the person is feeling something else. And this is a very interesting way to, to directly visually represent virtually consciousness. This is spectacular. And I see it going there very easily. It's not that far away. It, it, it's, it's already here. It just hasn't evolved in that yet. Or like think of what the Pope or the Queen of England would wear as digital jewelry, you know, like, or even, well, obviously like superstars doing a music show, uh, they, they would have probably a programmed, costume change evolution throughout their show etc um and yeah that, that kind of goes to a general theme like i'll go on most saturdays i'll go to the gallery and people will visit and we'll talk about vr art and um let me give you another little spiel so the transition between um traditional art and vr art so what is it what's the most important thing that we're doing uh you know in my head right now so in the history of art we've been looking at art as here's a snapshot of what's in my mind here's a snapshot of another world whether it's real life or a surreal world and i'm only going to show you this through a frame so you're seeing me right now through a frame in my room right but i'm in my room <laughs> like I'm, I'm i'm a body in my room and you're not there but you're seeing it through the snapshot so Finally, VR and AR allows you to smash that frame and go go in the room. <laughs> You're in here. <laughs> and so that's really a historic moment. And I think a lot of people don't realize what that means. Um, and I think the most important part of it is it reduces the friction between the dream and the inspiration of one artist and their audience. So instead of looking at a snapshot, like it's hard, right? Like let's say that painting, right? So that painting, you can imagine that behind that painting, there's a whole other world of like rainbowy creatures and and like tentacles and stuff like that, and just light colors going everywhere. But unfortunately, we only have this one snapshot, and it took hours and hours and hours to make. So instead, now we're saying come into that world and experience the real pure thought behind that snapshot. Um, you know, like if this was a snapshot of me, it's just one of the many facets of 
of my body. And it's even more important when you're talking about an environment because, you know, one person, one, one character is not that important, but a world to explore, especially physically uh, to interact with is a lot more important and a lot closer to the contents of a dream. And so when we're looking at, um, you know, the history of art, so we've got painting, drawing, photography, video, it's always been that frame. There's only been a few exceptions. So real life drama, whether you're talking about you know, having an argument in the corridor or going to the grocery store or whatever, or like World War II, that's a real life drama and obviously we're in it. There's sculpture, which is like, it's a real physical thing that you can experience. Um, I guess probably architecture is one of the most uh, immersive real types of art right now, but it's, you know, architecture is not usually a, a circus type, a uh, artistic type, except in, in some few luxurious cases. You don't go to an architecture much like you go to a painting usually. Um, and then there's theater, right? Theater, there's real people, but you're kind of like you have to sit back and um, and not really participate. You have to see from a distance, even though it's real people. And so yeah, now we're we're going into a world where you are able to actually smash that frame, walk into the dream of the artist, and really experiencing experience it so it's really um it's really about reducing that friction between the mind and the dream of the artist to the mind and the dream state of the visitors or other artists and that's really the most important thing about uh virtual reality and augmented reality is that you can you can go in there and then beyond that you know there's a whole multiplayer aspect where you can live it with other people um, so yeah, that's some more rambling. And any any other questions? If you want to focus the conversation in, in a uh, a particular direction that interests you more, could you let me know some something else about three D scanning versus photogrammetry? For I suppose for beginner beginners, uh, standing from my own side, I haven't done any of those, and I'm intimidated by them. Um, I have a very good friend, Eli Jotova, who is mm -hmm. a very a um, very great artist uh, who deals with digital arts and I have asked her about it and she mentioned that it's easier for a beginner to use photogrammetry she also gave me a piece of software that, that I use but I want to know what you think about it and also I have found a Kickstarter project which seems like it's a great 3D scanner and I would like to bounce that, that idea off of you because you might be more aware of those the name of the what's the name of the Kickstarter project? I'm placing it in the chat. Uh, That's it. Okay. I want to. I wanted to know something also after we. Yeah, go ahead. I. I mean, a while ago, I, w I was. I was developing this. Um, Small, like I actually, it was actually a closed project with I, which I ended up doing for this small online residency, mm -hmm. and I used, like my, my main, um, so so the whole like show was about scanning, so it was different ideas of scanning throughout the practice of different artists, and by then I was just starting to use Connect as well, the Microsoft Connect connected to my PC for. Just you know, experimenting with it. Um, at the time, I was using, I think, the software called Scanact or something like that. And yeah, but then I started thinking about how you could like use this idea of hacking and apply it to AR in an urban context. So I was building this project because since I'm from Brazil, we have this very high density population and urban occupation in, in city centers, well, such, such as other urban um, cities around the world. But we have, we have these phenomenons which we usually have these like small pieces of terrain in between two, let's say, two apartments or two storefronts that will, will remain unoccupied because of real estate sort of negotiations, let's say. Um, 
So I started, and, and since I've always been like a very um, urban explorer, I really, like I've been into graffiti and biking a lot. I've always observed the city in a way that like, Capturing these empty, like, urban spaces wasn't just enough for me. I wanted to do something else with them. And I started thinking about, like, how could I bring 3D model assets to occupy, like, uh, an empty urban space with AR using my cell phone, using a mobile device, you know? Yeah, so let's say. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is where the basis where I created this project called Terrain Hacking. Which yeah. the idea would be like I would I would um, use a certain piece of software, a mobile software, to upload a database of um, 3D assets, which would be created by scanning. So mm -hmm. they would be created with the Kinect, and then I would apply these like 3D assets in like in like let's say like a live form on AR using a mobile device on these like empty terrains. I don't know if I if I was I made it clear, but I wanted to know, like, how would you make this happen nowadays? Because I did this project, I think it was like 2019, 20, I don't remember, but I very much wanted to revive it today. Right. What did you put in those slices of terrain? Like um, so, yeah, I, I basically, like, scanned the inside of small like environments in my like in my apartments so let's say like a small bucket or like a helmet and, and like a small table or like even like abstract sort of things when you would like move around it would just get like a small piece of texture of a wall so those would would be just sort of like the assets i was using right um so I can show you some also some some um, example images later if you want. I'm I'm gonna send you a link. But yeah, right. go ahead. So what you want is you want people to visit those empty spaces and then see your assets in there, right? In augmented reality. Um, or you're kind of wondering. Um, what I actually wanted was like to be able to capture and sort of like a, let's say a snapshot or a picture, a moment of like when I was when I would be exploring these terrains, I could just move around digital assets on it and then take a picture and then use that picture let's say as an nft right right so yeah there's a lot to unpack there yeah, um, yeah. let's start maybe going into the photogrammetry versus 3d scanning and then that could lead into there so 3d scanning there's not a lot of 3d scanners um the best well the best affordable one right now is uh the connect azure and then you can you can get scanners that are like you know 30 to two hundred thousand dollars there's a whole other industry on it for a lot of it is like reverse engineering like you know basically industrial espionage for cars and stuff like that or you have a car part that you need to remake and so you need a really good scan so i think there's a there's a facebook uh, group called volumetric uh scanning or volumetric filming so I, I recommend that you join it if you're really interested in, in those types of things that's how i found the studio for eric Paré. it's a bunch of nerds obviously um so yeah there's not i would say for 3d scanners at our level that we're not you know spending a hundred thousand dollars you're kind of looking at the azure connect or there's a few other scanners from intel and uh, I'm not going to have the time to dive into that Kickstarter. It's always tricky with Kickstarter because nobody's tried it. And really what you want, like there's normally, it means there's two cameras normally on a 3D scanner. There's a real camera and then there's a 3D camera and those are both going to have different resolution. So you can have a 4K regular camera with a really low resolution 3D camera. So it'll be like only 400 by 600 pixels or something, which means your 3D scan is going to be very low quality. So just make sure to look at those specifications uh, for the highest amount of uh, pixels. And right now, I would say that the sweet spot is probably Azure Connect or um, some of those Intel cameras are OK as well, but not, not the best, but they're cheaper as well. Uh, in terms of photogrammetry, so photogrammetry for us, for people like us that don't have 150 cameras, it means that you're going to be using a DSLR camera or even your cell phone, right? But mostly, let's imagine that we have access to like a $300 DSLR camera or a $600 DSLR camera. So you want a tripod. 
And it's easy to capture things that are not moving, and you, you need to have the light uh, static. Um, so if you're, so let's say you're going to shoot a building, and it's going to take you one hour to take like 150 photos. If the sun is moving and there's no cloud, it's going to be a bit problematic because uh, when the computer tries to put all the images together, it's going to look and say, okay, well, uh, the shadow is here, and then the shadow is here. Is it even the same building? Which shadow do I show, et cetera? So in an ideal world, you can say, like, I, I could shut down my blinds here and just use artificial lighting, electrical lighting, and make my own studio in-house. And then, I don't know, like, take the speaker, take these headphones, and then scan them very easily. So I put them on the ground, take a bunch of photos from all different angles, or probably actually what I probably want to do is put like a fishing wire so that um, it's just hanging like this so that I can get a bunch of different angles more easily. So um, there's lots and lots and lots of guides for photogrammetry. A lot of it comes down to you want to have the least amount of depth of uh, depth of field so that when you're looking at that, you know, the headset or whatever, there's not there's nothing really blurry and you want to have a lot of different angles um thankfully it's pretty cheap the software is pretty cheap so it's very easy to try at home if you have a good camera so the software i recommend is called reality capture um and i believe it's free it's free to use you only pay if you are going to export a 3d model so you can you can play with it and test the technology very easily actually for free if you already have a dslr um let me see here There is this one, uh, this one guy, and I'll share the screen Are here. You His name is Azad Balabanyan. I'll I'll share I'll share my screen really quickly. Have you seen bought an iPhone? Um, oh. Sorry, sorry. Okay, here we go. This is a great uh, resource for Hello you. Hello, everyone, and today. I'll... Sorry, I'm sharing the uh, I'm sharing the mic with him. It seems today. Uh, so you can see my screen now, right? So I highly recommend that you watch this video. It's called Using Reality Capture PPI for Cheap. And PPI is like per pay per whatever. It means that you don't pay anything unless you export a 3D model. So it's going to show you some tricks to use some high quality photo and some lower quality photo. So then when you export your model, it may cost you like, uh, what does he use as his example? I think. In his example, it's uh, $8 to export this model instead. No, it's 50 cents instead of $8. So by using his little tricks, it's almost not free, but it's very, very cheap um, to, to do this kind of stuff. Oops, sorry. I'm terrible at Discord. Um, so yeah, I would recommend, you know, if you got a DSLR, get a tripod. Take an object and just give it a try because you're you're going to start understanding what it likes and what it doesn't like by trying it out. Or, you know, for me, I try to scan a lot of architecture. So watch a couple uh, videos on how to do photogrammetry for objects or for architecture. Then watch a few videos on Azad, like how to, he's got some really nice trick on how to use reality capture, but it's very intuitive. You basically, Take a bunch of photos in a, in a setting where the light doesn't change with the tripod, and you don't have a lot of the depth of field in your cameras. Like, I, I'm not super great technically at camera, so go look at some tutorials for that. And then you just throw all of those photos at your software, and it's going to make a 3D model for you. It's literally like, where are the photos? Process now. Do you want me to reprocess some stuff? Do you want me to close some holes or whatever? But if you're not looking for a picture perfect uh, solution, I would just say like just jump into it if you've got the hardware around. And if you don't have a DSLR, you can probably still get a lot from your phone. Like I know Oreo Harvey, she just uses her cell phone to scan her own body. So um, whether it's just taking a video of your face, taking multiple photos, or there are some applications that will do it for you, you'll be able to do some um, some photogrammetry very easily. Uh, so. So yeah, you, you know, it wouldn't really work for a human unless you have multiple cameras because the human would have to sit perfectly still. So it could work for a human, let's say, in a chair or, or in a super restful position. But generally, if they move at all, it's going to mess up the entire thing. 
but yeah, you, you learn a lot just by doing it and kind of seeing what the computer works well with or doesn't work well with. And if you have a controlled environment, you can go back and just take more photos of whatever didn't work well. Um, and you can learn a lot just by doing it for an hour or two. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, any kind of side questions on, on the photogrammetry versus the 3D scanner question or? No, not for me, really. I'm just, just to like... All right, so I'll move into your question as to, you know, you want to do these captures of uh, real life. So I think there's many ways to do it, right? You could, I think if you want to stay pure and closer to the digital aspect of things, uh, I would try to present the project in VR, perhaps. So let's say you have an alleyway. You could do a photogrammetry shoot of that alleyway, then bring that in, or it seems like you already have that environment as a 3D model. So bring that into Unity or Unreal, and then add your elements into it, your bucket or whatever you've sculpted into it. And then you could make like kind of a museum in VR of all of those spaces. Um, the other more traditional way, like, I think the, well, I say traditional, but it's not very traditional, but I think the more natural way of doing it would be to say, hey, I've scanned all of these places around the city and I've added elements to them. So when you go walk around the city and you go in this alleyway, you can experience those things with your cell phone. Now, here's the problem. Um, that's a bit hard to do, right? So the, the kind of old school way of doing it would have been through QR codes, which is not perfect. And normally QR codes, you need to pay a certain amount of money based on the usage. So it's not free necessarily. So we all know what a QR code is. There's a little symbol, you scan the symbol and then the thing pops up next to it. Um, the kind of new way that we're doing it is through what's called the AR cloud. So the AR cloud is this idea that uh, if Sam puts a snowman or a giant carrot in the middle of the park and you go into Sam's application, you're going to be able to see that giant carrot in the middle of the park in augmented reality. Now, that means for me, I need to have an AR cloud tracker. And also, I need to pay so that if 10,000 people load that geometry, I'm going to pay Google or uh, Neontic. Uh, a fee and the AR cloud is really in its birth. So, for example, at the mural festival last year, we did I, I organized a augmented reality well parks actually, and so we put a bunch of VR art in the park. And then when you came around with your cell phone in the mural app, which is the name of the uh, graffiti festival, um, you'd go around in the park, you'd go to these spots, and then some art would appear in the park. So we had to pay like based on how many people load those models. And uh, it's very imperfect in a way, like if you don't catch it from the right angle or if it's snowing, it won't work, or if it's raining, it may not work, things like that. And so, but with that being said, it's, it's in its birth and it should still be explored because in, you know, three to five years, it'll be easy to do this. And so when it does become easy, you'll want to have good content and you'll want to have thought about it. Um, so that would be one way of doing it. Now, in terms of, OK, all of this sounds complicated. Like, how am I going to show? I, I don't want to pay for trackers. How am I going to show people a VR experience? You know, that's tricky. If you don't have a gallery that's got VR, they can help you out. So probably the more DIY aspect of this would be um, you want to go in the alleyway with your object on your cell phone and put it in AR and then take a snapshot of it or a video of it and then make an NFT out of that. So how are you going to do that? Well, we know that on Hicketnunk, when you put an object, it's available as an augmented reality. So that could be one way, but then it means you have to make, it implies that you need to make a 3D NFT before you make your video of the same NFT in context. So um, I think there's like Adobe Aereo, which will allow you to put some 3D objects in augmented reality. There's probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps that do this. And some of them may be more sketchy or virus-like than others. So I would go with the more known ones like Adobe Aereo. Uh, I think Adobe Aereo will just kind of let you, any 3D model, you can put it in the space. 
Um, and, and we're seeing this more and more like with augmented reality glasses like the HoloLens or Magic Leap, you can load a 3D model and kind of place it anywhere. So th those would be my three options. Try to make a gallery in VR of those spaces. Try to make those spaces available in augmented reality through an app. Or just kind of put it in AR on your phone and then document that experience. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more like I like, I think the second option makes a little bit more sense for me, but I like, I like both actually. Yeah, and I really think the VR, I don't know, the, the VR to me is where there's a lot of, uh, of possibilities like for, for stuff like that. Um, but anyways, I don't want to get too, too carried away in that direction. Um, any other questions or kind of comments or uh, any other directions you'd like me to talk about? Or that goes for the whole group. All right, let me see here in my list if there's anything I should uh, discuss. Right. Well, I think there's another issue, which is the accessibility of VR art, right? So I highly encourage you to discuss this with galleries around you, because even if you're able to afford a VR computer, you're going to want to show it to the crowd at some point. And right now, if you make a VR experience, you're only reaching 1% of the people that do have a VR headset. And realistically, you're probably reaching 1% of 1% of people. Um, or even less, et cetera. And so it's really not a, a good way to uh, grow and, and make this a mainstream thing. You don't want like a niche of a niche of a niche. And so I really encourage you to talk to your galleries or even libraries or schools or you know universities and, and encourage them to um, acquire VR or AR equipment. And like personally, I'll pretty much support any gallery that is interested in, in doing that. And for me, that means, you know, uh, telling them which VR headset to uh, order, telling them what specification of computer to order, or helping them buy it once they have the budget. So if you're able to have a gallery locally that can show this art to the general population, it's really going to speed up uh, the entire thing for you as well as as give more value to your art if you're doing it in VR or AR. And it's kind of inevitable that VR and AR art is going to be important, but it's going to take a while. And so if you if you have kind of an ally locally in the culture, uh, it's really going to help spread um, those new technologies a lot more easily to the people that, that don't even consider having a VR or AR headset. So there's a little bit of um, activism to be done, if you will, or, or education to be done. So, um, and the other thing too, is if you come to a gallery and you say, hey, I can help you go into VR, it's good if you have a circle of friends or knowledge of, of people. Like personally, I, I do curation for that exact purpose because if I'm the only person doing VR in the city, uh, well, I'm not first off, but if I'm, the only, if, if I'm the only person trying to sell VR art in the city, it's gonna be really hard, whereas if, if there's shows of VR art, there's shows of AR art, and every month or two, there's a new VR artist in the gallery. Well, people are going to start thinking about it. Collectors are going to start considering it and seeing it as more something serious, something real. So um, that that's kind of like a, uh, some proletizing, I guess, you could do uh, in your own local environment. Because if you had one gallery that shows VR art, like in Brazil or something, there's a lot of artists in Brazil that uh, that are really, really good at VR art. It's just they're having to show it in America because there's probably no local places to, to show it locally. Um, so yeah, that, that's another part of the challenge that can be attacked from a different angle. Any other uh, questions or comments or directions you'd like me to explore?
Okay, so I'll take the silence as a no. <laughs> and um, well, I wish I could be more implicated, uh, but I've been crazy busy lately. So normally I'd say like reach out to me, but I know that I'm probably not gonna have time for two, three months to respond to anybody. So I won't. Um, really looking forward to what you folks uh, do during, you know, thanks to Vertical Crypto for, for all of this mentoring and this time and this energy. So really looking forward to um, seeing what you folks do with all of these ideas. And uh, hopefully you revolutionize the future of um, leftover architectural spaces and makeup and, and uh, you know, jewelry and fashion in the future of VR and AR. Hey Sam, this is Borja. Wanted to say thank you so much for uh, sh shedding some light on this. It's uh, really the bread and butter of my project, and I know nothing about it, which has given me has been giving me some uh, anxiety. That's the least amount of it, if you think so. And also, I would love to share more about the 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 place where I'm going to go with this project. So first, this this one this one that I'm doing right now is just to test out technology and things. But I'm actually going to be bringing something else next year, which could include the what I believe the world of contemporary jewelry art. I don't know if you know much about contemporary jewelry art because it's um, a very niche portion of contemporary art. But these are pieces that are not exactly wearable. Sometimes they can be quite disruptive of what a jewelry piece is. And um, this world is highly underrepresented into the digital world it's literally nobody is doing it there right. are two or three people who have uh, you know very timidly ventured into ar and vr for fashion fa uh, so fashion vr i, I suppose in a way mm -hmm. but that's about it and uh, from all the exhibitions that i've been to there there have always been there have there, sorry, there's only been one person who actually did something that you can put the cell phone towards your hand and see it, mm -hmm. which I think is very, very backwards. And I, uh, whenever I hear virtual exhibition, I always imagine what we were talking about in this, uh, in this talk. And whenever I see what my colleagues have done, it's always just pictures of what you would see and it's massively underwhelming. So I'm willing to change that in the coming year great two three months four maybe five so i think that by that time uh, you might be able to help me more accurately. Great. And i would love that and thank you so much for sharing all this with us well i'm glad that you have the courage to go where nobody is going and where everybody's avoiding and you know because it's too complicated and it's not realistic um you know it sounds silly but like I think it's very likely that one celebrity or one fashion designer notices these things like we're they're they're looking, you know, it seems often it seems like you're going to be working alone for years and years and years. And I know I felt that way for the last 10 years, but um, like it could be that, yeah, it could be that one celebrity all of a sudden wants to have a, a video shoot with just digital fashion and they're going to go and find what's different. And so I, I, I'm very glad that you're going in these uncomfortable waters and, and doing the discoveries and uh, figuring out what the jewelry of the future is. So thank you for your courage. I think all of this is so interesting. It's just so very interesting. And that's why I'm going in it. And I think that it just brings with it all these implications about the real world. For me, I'm just doing it because it's so fun. The other than that, we'll see. The other thing too is like, you know, same thing with VR architecture, with uh, VR and AR fashion, that stuff is going to come back to influence reality and is going to change culture in a way that we can't, we're going to find stuff that we can't anticipate or often it's this concept of emergence, right? Like, it's not like, oh yeah, do VR and AR and these things will happen. We don't know what's going to happen. And these things that we don't know are going to start affecting reality. And it's that emergence, it's, it's that unknown that is so fascinating, so exciting uh, to think about. So I think we'll end it on that note. And uh, I wish you all happy emergence and a great new year. <laughs> all right. You too, Sam, Thank you. Have Thank a you, Sam. great time a in one. your project. Bye, guys. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Yo, Sam, thank you.